at AIA Australia, helping your clients in their time of need is our number one priority. In 2016, we paid over $1.15 billion in claims to both retail and group members. That's over $4.5 million every working day. To offer your clients cover you can trust, chat to your AIA CDM today. Welcome to XY Live. We've uh, just a big shout out before we start to AIA, uh, who's been a great supporter this year. Uh, we have, if you haven't checked out their, uh, their health and wellness um, take on life insurance, the discounts available, uh, boost juice vouchers, a lot of advisors are getting great engagement out of uh, how they've set their product up. And a lot of the clients are really enjoying it. They're getting, they're getting trips, um, flights and things like that. And it's, um, yeah, it's proving, it's proving a good way to get people much more engaged with their life insurance and, and helping with retention. There's a lot of stats around how it's helped uh, people maintain their insurance. So today we've got Ben Martin from the FDA. Welcome. Thank you for having me. This is, this is my first time we've done this um, live in person. It's very intimate. Like I've uh, usually got a screen between me and uh, whoever we're interviewing. So, um, and I probably maybe won't be able to be as brazen because Ben could easily just hit me. Um, so I might, I might have to keep it, uh, keep it uh, PG. We're going to be talking about the white paper that, uh, they've been working on the last last few months. So it's something that they just released last week. They um, there's a lot of work that went into it. It canvases a whole lot of the marketplace in terms of what's out there for fintech. Um, we're going to go into a bit about that and just to see where we go. There's some so much interesting stuff in here. We could go in so many directions. But I guess to start off with, then why? What was what kicked it off? Yes. Yeah, so. Um I, uh, well, my job is to read government legislation, regulations, um, often that is very long and boring. And so what I do to keep myself sane is research technology, a bit of a geek at heart. Um, so are you going out, so your job description, but what's that? Yeah, absolutely. Nice. You gotta, you got, you know, I get my job done as, as efficiently as I need to. As long as you keep Dante else, happy, you can go do some other stuff. That is exactly right. <laughs> um, no, so, so a couple of things happened. Um, a few years ago when I was working at State Super Financial Services, we did a massive transformation project and one of the things we did there was map out the whole advice process, figure out where every bit of data comes and goes mm -hmm. and um, try and make the whole process as efficient as possible. Um, and with the increasing regulation, with the increasing cost of providing advice, and we know that there's a lot of technology coming in to provide advice, I started to think how can we start to support our members um, to understand technology because it's really overwhelming. There is so many options out there and it's really confusing. And, and one of the other things we hear a lot, and if you read the trade press, you can't help but pick this up, is that there is a fear that there are robots coming to take over our jobs. Mm. And I didn't believe it. Um, I didn't feel like that was true. Mm. And I thought there was a lot of good technology out there that we could be using. One of the most frustrating things I see is that the advice process takes, uh, we benchmarked in this report, can take up to 26 hours to provide a piece of advice. Um, it can cost $6,500, and that's before you make a single dollar of profit mm -hmm. um, in providing that advice. So, did you, so are, you, are you more fearful after doing it than before? No, absolutely <laughs> not. Um, I'm now significantly more encouraged that, that the future of, of financial advice will be with a with a, a person helping. Okay. Technology will most likely replace all the um, all the bits it can. Um, Is that because you haven't seen anything in press around that um, interaction with the client sufficiently? Yeah, so I, I think there is that, mm -hmm. but um, the same way that when we have something that doesn't feel right with our bodies and we go to a GP to get a more in-depth opinion on, on what's going on. You can Google it, you can try to do it yourself, mm -hmm. but if you really need someone to look after your health, you go to a GP. Mm. And you need someone to blame as so. well. Absolutely. So I feel like given health is the most important thing in people's lives, and if you're healthy, um, you, you're generally gonna have a good life. If you're financially secure and you're healthy, then everything's taken care of. So in the same way, I, my feeling is that financial planning Financial planners um, have a long, long and successful profession ahead of them. Um, 
but what we need to embrace is that there are cheaper, there are quicker, and there are more efficient ways for us to provide advice so that we can really focus on the bit that the client really values. And what the client values is somebody helping them figure out what their goals are. I mean, we all know clients come in and see us and you say, what are your goals? Mm. And they got no idea. And we need to lead them. Mm. We need to help them develop those goals and help them understand what they want to achieve. Yeah, and so that's, on that, on technology that can't do that. How, so you haven't seen anything really impressive in that space, in the goal discovery space, is that? No, the, is there, there, are some, there are some tools. <laughs> it's a long paper. It's There's pages. a lot in there. Um, no, there, there certainly are some... So some, defining the scope. So we've got... So there certainly are some um, some bits and pieces that are coming in there. And if, mm. you, if you have a look at the white paper, mm. uh, which if you haven't found it, it's at fpa.com.au slash fintech. Um, and you can either look at the digital version or the PDF version. Mm -hmm. um, what you'll see in there is that, is that we've mapped, um, mapped technology to different parts of the advice process. And, and if you have a look at that table... Yeah, um, so it's got, so it's sort of got a bit of a linear process of... The traditional advice process, so to speak, and where um, I guess you guys have evaluated where each of these plug into it, yeah, as close as possible. So, so we looked at we looked at about four hundred fintechs in Australia. Um, we had a look at which ones were providing advice or or a step in the advice process, and then mm -hmm. we mapped them mapped them into the advice process. So one of the areas that is poorly covered by by fintechs is is that uh, defining goals and objectives mm. for the client. So it is something something that fintechs could definitely have a look at and say mm. that there's more we could do here. But I think even then, um, consumers want validation. They want to make sure that they've got the right goals in mind. Mm. They want to know that if they've got a goal, that it's actually achievable. Because the last thing you want to do is set a goal that you've got absolutely no hope of, mm. of ever achieving because um, that's just going to make you drop it quickly. It's like all those New Year's resolutions we make. We've got, mm. in a lot of instances, we've got no chance of making it. <laughs> Mine's going pretty well this year, but um, oh, yeah, what was your? I want to lose some weight, so uh, I'm about 13 kilos down. So that's, you? that's going pretty good. Um, but I think goal setting. married girls. So. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Goal setting is um, goal setting is particularly challenging for, for consumers, and I think goal setting is something that a, a planner will always have a role in, in helping clients. Yeah, I'm interested. Is it? Did you work out why? Is it because it's a harder, because it's so um, objective, subjective, that's such a unique sort of interaction? Is that why the fintechs, a lot of these guys, like my, my understanding of a lot of the fintech guys, it's a lot of technical people that understand how to do processes and stuff. That is it bridging that gap to the human a bit more in terms of that interaction? Is that sort of, I don't know, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but that's sort of, a bit of the impression I get that because it's out of a linear process and yeah. it's a bit more sort of editorial and it could go in many different directions, it's harder to, it is, it is to synthesize. <laughs> it is certainly harder to, uh, to figure out goals. But I mean, the other thing, the other thing I think is the sexy part of financial services is implementation. It's, is it's, it? it <laughs> well, I think, from, I think from an outsider's perspective, I mean, how often do we get clients coming in saying, I want to invest in something? I want you to sort out my investments. It's that. Well, it's, the, it's the point where we need to do something to help us well, out. <laughs> exactly. That's, I think that's, but if you look at what consumers think about financial planning, if they haven't had a financial planner, it is that they will help me manage my investments. Mm. Now we know that's not. Yeah, it's annoying having to deal with that every time they come. So. For me, it was the 5%. Was the five percent bit with what I do with my clients? Mm. It was that last step. Advisors. Okay, we now have to do something, and we now have to implement. Yeah, it's really investment portfolio. <clears throat> but so I think from the outside, where fintechs think the sexy bit is, mm. is that implementation step, and so that's what I think a lot of them, a lot of them are focusing on. If you have a look at the is plan, that the multiple planning step? Oh, that's oh, so implementation. So yeah, so we've got acorns in there, and that's sort of like just. I think a lot of advisors are using Acorns as like a like a small client won't pay for advice, but just give them some value by yeah. introducing them to Acorns. Have yeah. a look at it. And I mean, you've got your um, you've got your spaceship supers and your your gross mm. supers, which I know have had a bit of conversation um, through the XY forums. And and I think that's that's the bit that fintechs think is is the place to be and where most people have the problem. Mm. 
And I think that's probably right to some respect. Implementation mm. is. Well, if you're looking at the friction points. Yeah. Yeah. It's it definitely. And this is the thing that I see, I think, with fintechs, or well, not just people, how they look at um, They look at the existing frame. And this is some of the challenges with, the, with who's going to end up being more successful down the track, because a lot of them are just trying to fix existing problems. Mm. And those problems won't be there in a couple of years. So it's the one, we're the ones that are doing like something that's completely new because that's actually, the ones that are just fixing problems, everyone's sort of getting there. It's been a bit of a retarded um, evolution in financial advice, arguably because of um, maybe the concentration of influence of certain providers, yep. not really um, uh, perpetuating much competition. Mm. Um, but yeah, I, like my assumption is that anything that's sort of more functional, cool, that'll be taken care of. Every, there'll be lots of providers to be able to do that. What are the ones that are going to have maybe a bit of IP? And the IP, I reckon, is around sort of the interaction with the client, yeah. different ways that you visualize or experience with the client, and then how that links to the ongoing piece. Yeah. Because a lot of them, and that's the other thing, I think a lot of, a lot, everyone's looking at that sort of transactional initial piece. Absolutely. Whereas arguably, if you talk to most of us that have been running business for years, the value and the client perceived value is that ongoing relationship. Absolutely. Is and there I anything think... that's awesome coming through in that space? So that's an so that review step is also something mm. that that a lot haven't been really dealing with. The bit that they're trying to do around reviews is aggregating data mm. and providing it back to clients and the planner in a more seamless way that makes it easier. Mm. The other side of the review process that I think a lot are working on is sort of that um, client value, doing surveys, trying to quantify whether or not the client's happy with your services. Mm -hmm. How do we take that to the next step? And I think that's sort of where they're focusing. Yeah. Um, well, the one I mean, I had a really interesting meeting yesterday with a, somebody, with a group that's not in financial services, and they primarily deal with salespeople, mm -hmm. but they've kind of seen a... They've seen some areas where the services that they've built and the technology that they've built can seamlessly be brought across to financial planning. Okay. Um, and they need to understand financial planning a bit more. And, and, we, and um, What's the nature of the services? So they, they've created a, they've effectively created a presentation platform. So to present information to a client. So, so to a modern and an SOA sort of thing. The worst way to think about it is modern PowerPoint, which is absolutely not like Prezi or something. Yeah, yeah, but it's it's cool. Yeah, cooler. Um, Less laggy. Yes. More importantly, what it does is is it picks up all the data that you've got anywhere, so it can connect to your CRMs, it can connect to your data feeds, it can connect to your modeling software, and it can pull it all into a presentation. Um, and you could use that. How much guidance do you have to give it to do that? So there's a, there's a setup process, but as soon as you, I mean, if you think about how long it takes to set up a PowerPoint presentation where you might be presenting advice to your client, it, it takes a long time. You might have templates, but you still got to collect data from all the different places, not personalised. They did a demonstration for me, and within 10 seconds, they pulled in all this data from all the different databases, and they had a presentation that was ready to go live to the client. Wow. And the compliance behind it was spot on like you could interrogate every where every bit of data has come from it was all captured it was all time so stamped. auditable so to speak it was auditable mm. and Would so you, you could use that for, and I know you've done a lot of work in trying to figure out how to make the fact finding um, easier, easier yeah. and, and the data flows all over the place this is probably the next step on from you that in making it actually a lot more engaging a lot more interesting for the client to, oh, be, you definitely got my attention to, be, <laughs> to be doing so my point is around that, around reviews, around goal settings, there are probably a lot of ideas that are coming from, that will come through technology from other professions. Yeah. And what we need to go out there and, and help these technology companies understand is that financial planning is very specific as a profession. It's very different from the, the other professions. But from a technology perspective, there's a lot we can learn from solutions that have come from other places. Mm -hmm. As I said, I think most fintechs are looking at the, um, implementation step, and if you look at mature tech, um, you, um, and you look at fintech, and you look at a lot of these players that are playing around financial planning, a lot of them are really focusing mainly in that, in 
presentation step. Well, they're fixing, they're fixing business everything. problems. Yeah. But are they enhancing the client? No, they're not. So that's, yeah. And there's a lot of work to be done yeah. in that space. And well, some of these guys are getting there. Well, it was interesting. Uh, a lot of, I think, like if we look at, uh, like last week when we were presenting at the FBA with Corey Wasselin, we were talking about Loom and how he, he uses that. Um, so adding video and the communication piece. I think that's sort of, if you talk about the traditional model of, um, yeah, go and do and stuff and then come back, yep, yeah, here's your SLA and going through it in that session. There's a couple of guys in the XY group where they've talked about doing videos before the SLA and really sort of, because if you think about the, the shock to the system that people get and just really being empathetic around that, um, the soaking up of all that information because it's so much to take in. So I think it's, I really think it's like some sort of artistic scope of how you drip feed and just sort of gradually get people on board with the advice instead of like so many people just get scared once they get the box. Like, yeah, I mean, cool. and that's the problem with a 100 page A4 technology mm. piece of advice. Yeah, you, you're working on getting that legislated that it can't be more than 10 pages yet. No. No, you're not? No, oh, I, I, sorry. Don't, I don't. Um, that might have been another policy person. <laughs> Look, I, I there's a lot of us around. <laughs> um, no, I mean there's a lot of there's a lot of um, talk about making advice more engaging, more understandable to clients. But when we base a piece of advice on using an A4 piece of paper and mm. delivering it, the scope of what we can do is really limited. Mm. Um, there are absolutely legislative requirements that have to be included in SOA, but there is nothing that says it has to be an A4 piece of paper. So when you talk about video, mm. why can't we be integrating video into the advice piece that would replace mm. 80 of those 100 mm. pages? Why can't we be using interactive web pages where the client, where the clients, if they only want a simple piece of advice, can just get the simple bit that's there? Mm. If they want to dig in deeper and get more information, they can start to click, mm. click on more information. They can click out to videos. They can. Um, the SOA might be live, like mm. the data, the, the data feed that's coming in, there has yeah. to be a snapshot on what the basis of the advice was. Mm. But then everything from that point on can be live. And this is how you're tracking and this is how you're implementing and that feeds back to the planner and the planner starts to go, well, you're off track or you're ahead of track. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's a bit like going from 2D live. where we are now to Absolutely. a 3D sort of environment where yeah, although I'd you'd like be to hologramming it like I'd that. Like I'd, to I'd like to take 4D by making it live. Yes. And let's let's use time in the way that time is is intended to be used mm. in that it moves forward and therefore our plan moves forward. So mm. I, I wanna kind of break that thinking. And I've had are you plenty of conversations. Or is, Am I itching for capital? Are you pitching for capital? No. Or? Somebody much Ben's smarter. got some good ideas out there if anyone wants. Somebody much smarter than me needs to needs uh, to solve it's a funny this. thing. But I'm supposed to be smarter people out there, but sometimes they just don't get it. They don't get the issues. No. But I and but I, I mean I've been having a lot of um, strong conversations with ASIC over mm. this SOA project they're doing. That's um, why in 2017 we're about to release another sample SOA from ASIC that, that's based on a piece of paper. Mm. Is it at least shorter? It's longer than the previous sample. Although I would, it is significantly better written okay. um, than the previous previous versions. So less um, open to interpretation. Uh, I well, the SOA sample is was never intended to be. This is exactly what you need to put in an SOA. It's ASIC's mm. idea around what what does need to be an SOA, but how you would do the rest of it. Mm. And so you're not you're not meant to design an SOA exactly like it, but it mm. is to give you some ideas about so what points. needs to be in there, um, and, and maybe the type of language and style of information that you're providing to the client. I think they have done a significantly better job okay. in that than, than previous iterations. But well, as I keep saying to them, why paper? Yeah, well, send us a video. Yeah. Good luck with that one. Uh, <laughs> I'll get there. I'll get there. <laughs> one thing that was really cool, I thought, was um, there's a fintech threat. <laughs> so there is still a bit of fear to be considered. Yeah. And, well, what I would say is we, we did go in and, and have a look at, at um, those fintechs that are talking about replacing financial planners and you mm. only, no longer need to have a financial planner. And what Not I just in their branding, but actually being able to do it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, 
And what I would say is that there are some that are tinkering around and doing doing bits and pieces. And what I would suggest is if you have a look at them, none of them are overly impressive or, or worth really um, worrying about. But having said that, they are thinking about how to make different steps of the device process more efficient and more engaging for consumers. And there's definitely something to be learned in there. So there's a bit of a foundation there that if you fast forward with more development, you yeah. can see. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, I think while they're trying to, while they're saying they're trying to compete, there would be a lot more value in them in working with us. And there's a lot of them that I would argue for implementation purposes, you could very quickly pick up and use with your clients and they might get a better experience, mm -hmm. but you, you're controlling it as the planner. And I think some of them are absolutely worth looking at from that perspective is how can I integrate mm -hmm. those into my advice process because um, well, they are saying. more engaging. Well, that's what we've seen in the US in terms of the whole wealth front, that sort yeah. of thing. And they're going for the direct market in terms of auto advice or robo advice yeah. and implementation of investments. But they've found, they've done a shift and they've sort of gone to a model where advisors are sort of overseeing a lot of it. Yeah. And they're, uh, most of them are focusing on like a really narrow portion of someone's wealth. Mm. Whereas once clients start to get comfortable with their financial situation, start to get comfortable with, with their goals and objectives and what they want to do, they invariably start to broaden out that significantly. Mm. When the solution is only looking at this, that's where a human comes in and being able to put all those pieces together and interact all together. So mm. that, yes, our investments are looked after, but also our estate planning is right. And mm. while we might be locking money up in investments, we still need to make sure our cash flow is working for us. And well, this is, yeah, it's always, And I think that's where a person... Well, will it comes back to sort of a bit like that session we had when we sort of talking with Dante oh, a few months ago when we were mm -hmm. talking about Okay, so we've got this fiduciary obligation to be conscious of these other areas. How does it, what, if this is, if this is technically advice what's coming out of these uh, machines or applications, how, how do they not have that obligation to cover that fiduciary duty? Even, even if it's not an individual, like it's a, essentially a duty that if anything's identified in their data that should indicate estate planning or whatever, is that like is it a bit of a two we're gonna double standard going on there a little bit yeah a, a little bit mm. and, and i think um when you see what's happening with asic sandbox and what you think what you see being dealt with with the, the government's sandbox that they're trying to propose mm. that they are trying to make it easier for fintechs to come in um, mm. into this space and, and there is some questions about whether or not they're fully needing fiduciary duties, their, mm. their regulatory obligations when they're well, doing What's that. the official stance on that? Like, it's not going to make a difference. Well, like, we might, we might think it's a, well, a sure no, no, well, thing. So ASIC is, ASIC's very clear in their guidance um, to fintechs mm. that they need to comply with, when they're fully licensed, they need to comply with all licensing obligations, including best interest duty, including mm. SOA. Um, some of them are trying to skirt around this general advice, personal advice mm. tightrope and not doing a particularly good job at it um, and and I think those will get picked up and sorted out in the not too distant future. Well, I guess the but, chat, I'll go on. No, I mean, what I was going to say is where, um, and I know a few people through XY have picked up some technology and some players out yeah. there that aren't, um, aren't doing the right thing in mm. their view and we certainly investigate them on your behalf and then we talk to ASIC and we, mm. we ask ASIC to have a look at them and I don't know a few of those that are leading on to more those conversations. Say, yeah. Um so so those you know, if you see something and tell us and we'll mm. we'll talk to ASIC and, and start to get it sorted out. But ASIC is becoming more and more aware of the fact that technology comes in, mm. it provides services to a much broader and much bigger segment of the market than what a, a financial planner can do face to face. Mm. Um and they they want to make sure that that's all operating correctly. Yeah, so the so the way that they um, they want them to they want to give enough sort of incentive for them to get in there and have a go and get some innovation. Yeah, and that's a delicate balance. I guess I guess um, one thing that's interesting around the best interest view is that there's not much grounds for them to work off, considering there's not much grounds for best interest view in our environment as it is, because there's no case law. In there's only one example the other week of you know, 
and I don't know all the details, but it's probably not too deep because it's such a wide scope of SSG, like you're going to need a lot of case law to really define all those aspects because <laughs> it's a part of aspect and it's broad. Yeah, so I was asked, I was asked yesterday at a presentation whether or not BOFA has worked mm. and my gut feel is BOFA will work, but has BOFA worked to date? Probably not, mm. not yet. And what I mean by that is that we've got three and a half thousand advice of licensees because the guidance is what the guidance is, and because we haven't had a lot of case law, there's three and a half different three and a half thousand different interpretations of how to implement the best interest. Mm. So at the and moment we're just seeing a bit of a it's just sort of a marble and uh, Exactly. It's the, it's the survive, feel, man. Yeah, it feels yeah. feels like it's in the best interest. Exactly. So um will FOFA work? Absolutely. Has FOFA worked? I think we've still got a long way to go. We've spent a lot of time and money on getting here today, and I think for a lot of advice licensees, there's going to be a, a lot more work to do to get where we need to get to over time. Yeah, the thing is around it's it's to me it feels like it's just going to be so dictated by what the legal environment interprets it as, because at the moment there's just so much. Maybe arguably, depending on how things play out, mm. they're going so over the top in terms in some licensees because they just they just want to make sure that they're covered. The costs to deliver advice get increased by that, and all this uncertainty is just creating this sort of you've got this sort of bottleneck state. That until there actually is some um, some cases where people have the points have been argued, it's been hashed out as what's reasonable for clients, what's reasonable for advisors to be across. You so we're going to be in this limbo for years if they don't if there's no acceleration in in legal proceedings. Yeah. No, oh, absolutely. I mean, even and a case in point is this general advice, personal advice definition, and we've kind of only seen the first case come through, come, come through now, um, and and that was brought in in two thousand one in its current form. Mm. So, um, yeah. So we've, you know we're potentially a long way from getting any certainty around this. Um, I mean, what we'd say to members is follow the code and, yeah. and you should be pretty right. But, um, yeah. That's the code of ethics they've got. Code oh, of professional okay. practice. Jeez, it's like a whole other compliance set if you follow it to the ticket. Um, but it covers everything. So. Oh, absolutely. You can, feel, you, you can feel very secure if you follow the whole code. That's, and your clients can feel secure as well. That's right. <laughs> the, um, I guess with... with where are you going with this? Where where do you see this? Because like you you've gone digital with this. Obviously it's a document. Yeah, you've I'm holding the document because it's hard to put up on the screen here. But um, I didn't want it. I was I didn't want to do a piece of paper version of it. But, mm. um, but you've got it on the website. Now, we've got it on the website, so you can read it all. Is that publicly website. available? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So fpacomau slash fintech. Yeah. Um, where I want so. I wanted to deliver a full project out of this for Congress, um, but we did what we could do in, in the time. Actually, yeah, on that, a shout out to Andy Marshall for the help he's Thank given. You, Andy. Yes, Andy, yeah. did a, Andy did a great job helping us with this. A random, I bumped into him randomly around Easter this mm. year at Bunnings yeah. and looking at lawnmowers, and uh, this report has, has come out of that, that chance meeting. Um, no, so this. This uh, report is designed to be a thought starter. Mm. It's designed to talk about what the issues in advice are and where technology plays a part and why fintech is not a threat, why it's mm. in most cases really useful to the advice process, how it will save time, how it will mm. save significant amounts of money and how it will make the advice process more engaging. Um, I've got another two projects off the back of this that I want to get done mm -hmm. in the next four months or so. Yeah. Um, and then that will hopefully culminate in something massive at Congress next year yeah, um, that, that I'm starting to think about and start explaining out for, for members, although I would love to hear what other people's Yeah, well, I'm sure it's only been out there like a week, so it'd be great to, if anyone in the group's got feedback, feel free to send it through to Ben. He's pretty, um, he's, a bit, oh, he's happy to feel receive good or bad feedback absolutely and i i look at every thread that's going on in xy so feel free yes. to jump in there and, and comment yeah yeah i don't comment on everything but yeah. I, I look at everything well tell them what you think um one of the key things i reckon that they've really sort of nailed um in terms of the time frame so when i, I presented earlier in the year around sort of how do you choose what technology to implement 
And I guess from a business standpoint, there's all these great ideas and it's like, okay, we can improve our, um, how we engage with clients, cool. And you don't necessarily know sometimes what the uptick from that client interaction is going to be. And a lot of the time it's a great intent and sometimes it doesn't work out, sometimes it does. But in terms of the internal stuff, your internal problems with your business, you do know how long something takes you and who's doing it and how much their, their time's worth. Yeah, I would argue hmm. that a lot of businesses aren't that. So they don't a know lot that of practices yet. don't haven't really ever sat down and thought it actually takes me twenty six hours to write a piece of advice. They know how they know they have appointment. They hmm. have a meeting with a client and that might take an hour, but they forget that writing file notes, making sure your data's all up hmm. to date, that takes time and that adds to that that process. They don't think about how long it takes to write up instructions to do SOAs and then get the SOA back mm. and then review it. And, and the interaction then, between the power planner. And yeah, absolutely. So, so I don't know that a lot of businesses have set out and, and mapped their whole advice process and mm. gone, this bit takes this amount of time and costs me this much, this mm. bit takes me this amount of time and costs me this much. I mean, just research, for example, finding out what the client's current funds are, doing a comparison to other products that mm. might be out there. I mean, that takes... Yeah, if you're doing it properly. Okay. Absolutely. So the second project that I'm working on off the back of this mm. is to try and build a, a tool for, for our members so mm -hmm. that they can actually sit down and go, this bit of the advice process takes this long and it costs me this much. And so if I can find a solution that's going to cut that time mm. or cost me significantly less mm. uh, and it's going to make the advice process more engaging for the client and therefore they're willing to pay more and then they're willing to stay with you and mm. they're willing to recommend you, then mm -hmm. all of that makes the whole advice process significantly better. Because so you've started to put in the next time project. savings into the ones that are already up there. Yeah, yeah. So the ones, so we identified 117 that have some interaction with the advice process. Um, about 70 of those are probably ready and they will be used in the market today. Mm -hmm. um, so you can go to them and be comfortable that you can integrate them into the advice process. Mm -hmm. And we went out to all of them and said, give us all this information that you know, our members would want if they were looking to implement you. Mm -hmm. um, so if you have a look at, at the, the website and then go into the Prezi, mm -hmm. uh, that we've used to step out the advice process, you can, you can select the individual fintechs and, and get really detailed information about mm -hmm. you know, who they are, how they're helping the advice process, what the time savings would be, what the cost savings would be, how much they cost, mm -hmm. um, whether or not they've got open APIs or closed APIs, mm -hmm. so you can figure out where to stick them, whether or not you can put them in your advice yeah, process play, uh, play 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 nicely. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you can you can start to have a look at that. So step two, I think, is is giving giving practices and planners the tools to actually figure out mm -hmm. what's taking so long. And, and if I can get my real vision done, maybe even saying this is a fintech that will help you save, save mm -hmm. time there. And, and the third bit that I want to do is, is one of the complicated bits is how do I approach them? What questions do I need to ask? Mm -hmm. What do I need to know from them? Will they play with what I've got mm -hmm. seamlessly and effortlessly? So um, I'm wanting to develop some sort of request for information, how to negotiate, mm -hmm. how to get information, how to take those well, steps. Well, arguably, if you're nailing the other stuff, then there won't be that many questions left. No, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you still need to go through that due diligence process. Well, every business is different. Well, exactly. Yeah. So you have to go through that due diligence process. You don't want to waste money. You don't want to muck around with things that absolutely aren't going to work for you or more importantly, won't be around in six months' time and mm. therefore you've wasted time and money integrating them. Um, the other questions and what's the information we need to, to get to. So that'll, that'll be the third project. Yeah. And then, as I said, when we get to Congress next year, how do we tie it all together? Mm. And it'll be in Sydney as well. It will be in Sydney. Yeah, it is. And I was down there today and it was a massive venue. So we've got oh, lots of space. Yeah, yeah. We've got lots of space and there will be lots of opportunity for us to do some things. So. Very exciting. Well, I think I think off the back of what Ben's saying, uh, if you if you don't actually have your your process, if you don't know what you're doing now, exactly. you've got no basis to go on. And and I think I think most people know what they're doing. Generally. But have they ever sat down and mapped it out? Mm. And do they know where one piece of data is collected and where it ends up at the other end. Mm. And, and what happens to it on the way. And what happens to it on the way. And I think, I think that, you know, there's a lot of collecting, entering, re-entering. Re-reading, checking. Writing on an application form. Application form coming back and having to rewrite it. And 
and then doing something with it in the review process. There's, you know, one piece of data, you might have to be handling it five, six, seven times during the advice process mm -hmm. when if you actually know how it works and know where it goes, you can get somebody else to enter it in Absolutely. and you never have to touch it. Totally. Well, the, so, yeah, I think that's a, that's my grand vision. That's awesome. Well, I reckon um, we've covered some good stuff and thanks thanks for coming on, Ben. No worries. I did say at the, uh, I had a presentation at the Congress and I said it's the most useful white paper ever done in financial services. So hats off to you. Thank you. Um, and, and obviously it's not just a, a static a static piece of paper. It's, it's something that's an evolving thing and I guess an ongoing resource for the advice community to tap into. Yeah, look, so initially we had, I think we've got about 43 fintechs that actually responded to mm -hmm. our RFI out of 70. Mm -hmm. um, I've had, I've got 10 meetings set up over the next two weeks for a number that missed out and now want to get in. So. Well, this is a shout out also to any fintechs more, like across this um, on the podcast or YouTube or whatever. Um, get in touch with Ben. He's happy to engage with any of the fintechs, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and they've got a process around assessing how relevant it is to financial advice. Yeah. And if it, if it meets that, then you can be on that, be in the, in the pool. Yeah, yeah. So the, the report's meant to be live. We will update it every time we've got updates to it. Um, it's meant to be a thought starter, but the, the actual mapping of the technology um, that the fintechs will all remain live and we'll, we'll keep those up to date. So mm. anybody that's in there at the moment has given us information. If their prices change, mm. we'll update their prices so that, um, so that you guys know what it's going to cost. And as I said, we're, we haven't restricted that to uh, members. We mm. have opened that up to absolutely everybody. So. So yeah, anybody in the profession can have a look. Very. Have you been? You've been hanging around XY Advisor a bit. Got a bit of an abundance mentality going on there. Absolutely. The, so, uh, the community of the profession is, um, is, I think, incredibly important to the future of, of of all of us. And and the best ideas come from everybody, not just not just one one person. So I mean, it's important in in policy work that I understand what everyone's views are and what their pain points are and mm. what they would like to see the profession and it's just as important with technology um, that we're doing the same so doesn't um, it make you warm and fuzzy FPA is a, FPA is a community <laughs> uh, you guys are a community and, um, well um, I don't know how to turn this off but yeah say bye to Ben everyone um, hey everyone thanks for your time yeah and we'll um, we'll talk about things more if there's anything mentioned in the Facebook group uh, Ben will jump on he, he, he's in there more than probably anyone in the whole Facebook group. So uh, <laughs> we'll get back to that.